Hello, and welcome to the Immigrants Incorporate podcast. My guest today is Bhavna Sharma Puri. Bhavna is a Bay Area resident who immigrated from India 19 years ago as a young girl all by herself. She lives here with her loving husband and is a mom to two beautiful and naughty kids who are seven and nine years old. Bhavna has built a successful career as a marketing leader with over 15 years of experience in various key roles in Silicon Valley. She is also the chair and council board member for California State University East Bay. Bhavna is a philanthropist who gives back to her community, whether it's mentoring other women in tech, first-gen immigrant mothers, or sponsoring homeless children education in India. In addition, Bhavna is a mom motivator, and she shares her advice for parents, especially immigrant mothers, through her blog, Love, Pray, Laugh, Slay. Bhavna models and dabbles in acting as a hobby. Bhavna and her husband are also real estate investors via their firm, Amber Investments. Her mantra is, you can do it all and have it all if you work for it. She's a type A go-getter who believes in giving each and every area of her life 100%. She's well known as someone who is always willing to help others, making people smile and radiating positive, happy vibes wherever she goes. Thank you for joining us. Hello and welcome to the Immigrant Incorporate podcast. On this podcast, you will learn from lived experiences how to thrive in the corporate workplace as an immigrant. My name is Lola Adeyemo. I am the CEO of EQI Mindset and the founder of the nonprofit Immigrant Incorporate Inc. I work with organizations to build inclusive workplaces. On this podcast, I will be amplifying immigrant voices from within corporate organizations through solo episodes, as well as guest interviews. It is a global world of work, and I'm very sure you can learn a thing or two from my guests who are originally from different parts of the world and their experiences working in the corporate workplace. Hello and welcome to the Immigrant Incorporate podcast. I am looking forward to my conversation today with my guest, Bhavna. Hi, Bhavna. Hi, Lola. How are you? I'm good. Nice to meet you. Nice to chat with you this afternoon. Likewise, super excited. Yeah, and it looks like we are on the same side of the US. So we have the same weather feelings right now. With the three digits absolutely. temperature. <laughs> oh, absolutely. The sunny California. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Well, um, let's jump right in. I would like to meet you if you could uh, introduce yourself, Bhavna, and tell us your well, immigrant story. I guess we can all already just tag that on. How did you get here and what's your background like? Yeah, thank you for having me. Happy to share more about myself. My name is Bhavna Sharma Puri. I am a first generation immigrant from India. And I got to the land of dreams, the United States, about 20 years ago as a 17 year old going off to college. Um, and this was for my undergrad at State University of New York in Buffalo. And since I've been here and made this my home away from home, I came to the U.S. To, to study, so I came on a student visa, an F1 visa. I'm sure my fellow international students will relate and went on to do my MBA in marketing as well and communications. And ever since I've been in the corporate world. Oh, OK, so you were the, the legal part. I definitely understand that because I came in through F1 as well. And, um, yeah, and that's interesting that you use the word. I was going to make a comment about that first generation immigrant, um, because I have a book called thriving in intersectionality. And when I started interviewing people for the book, I wanted to interview immigrants who were like me and who I thought I should use the phrase first generation immigrant. For myself, right? Because my children are born here, but I wasn't born here and my parents did not immigrate. It was just me, right? And I remembered I had an interview with someone that was saying, well, there's nothing like first generation immigrant. And I said, well, why? 
And they said, well, once you're an immigrant, you're always an immigrant. And that was, that was an interesting statement. So I said, what do you mean? My children are not immigrants. And she said, no, your children are immigrants. Your children's children are immigrants. And I was like, I guess it depends on, you know, it's all perspective and it depends on what part of the, the country you are. And I went on to interview people who were born in the U.S., by immigrant parents, and they call themselves and strongly associate uh, themselves as immigrant. Wow. Right? Yeah. To your point, association, I think at that point, we can say the United States is a melting pot because all That's of us exactly what I said. <laughs> are immigrants. You know, at that point, we're all a melting pot. It just depends on when you got into the country. Right. And that's what I said. I said, if I go by your definition, isn't everybody in the US an immigrant? Except there for Native you. Americans. <laughs> yeah, it, it, there you go. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. Yeah, well, yeah. you know, that, that's been my journey. And now yeah. I live in California, like you mentioned, with my two children. Uh, Ariana is nine, Viraj is seven, my lovely husband. And we do call Bay Area our home away from home. Yeah, that's a nice, that's a nice place to call home. So <laughs> I don't know if there's much difference between uh, Bay Area and New York, but... Um, what do you think? A lot, a lot of different <laughs> <laughs> for good I, or bad. How how do you mean? I feel like I, I belong in California, and I think it has to do a lot with how where I grew up and how I grew up. I grew up in the northern part of India, in a place that was um, warm in the summers, but been a very lush, very green, um, and even like geographically and topographically, I feel like when I landed in California. I felt like I had arrived home. It has pine trees. It has a trees and that I grew up around. So I feel at home the most here. Oh, that's that's so cool. And that's interesting too, because I've never looked at it from the California, the 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 geography, the yeah. layout. Um, I know I did pick Texas to come to grad school because of the weather. Oh, there when he I goes. was coming from Nigeria, I was like, I do not want snow. <laughs> and so you're a smart girl because when I immigrated, it was back when there wasn't a lot of data on the internet. There wasn't like Google groups, Facebook groups, or like even information overload that our children get today. I walked in because we got into, I got into three schools. I got into a school in California. I got into two schools in New York. My parents said, you go to the school in New York. And the reason was because we had two distant relatives and uncles and aunts there. That was the reason why I went to Buffalo, New York, which is super cold and did not know it was going to be like freezing cold there. I didn't know nothing about Buffalo. So I packed my stuff. I land in New York, like this young teenage girl who had no idea what she was doing. And the immigration officer, the one that stamps your passport, he goes to me, I hope you have a warm jacket and winter boots because I think, I hope you know where you're going. Oh, I did God. not, I did not okay. know where I was. I had I summer clothes. So went to the cheapest store we could find, bought $20 snow boots and a $20 jacket. And that's what I wore for the next six to eight months. Oh my gosh. <laughs> that is amazing. Yeah. yeah. Talk about leap of faith. <laughs> Serious leap of faith. But um, I think that also speaks to, again, trusting our parents. What your parents say, right? What you do. They have a lot of say in what we do, um, depending on how you grow up, right, as, as, as immigrants. 100%. And a lot of our Southeast Asian families do put um, preference on education, on giving good education to their kids and also just inculcating good values in, in us as I'm sure does your culture. And so when I come here and being in this country for so long, I hold on to that so dearly and so close to my heart because that's a gift I got from my parents that I want to pass on to my next generation. I want them to be rooted in our culture. I want them to understand our festivals. I want them to know the language, the food, and really savor this this culture so then they can then enjoy it. They can pass it on to their next generation. So it's very, very important to me that they go Sunday school, they understand Diwali, they understand everything that comes with our food, all of the great stuff. I know. 
So did you did you move into a large uh, Indian community or what was that like, that transition for you? I know you said you had some family. Uh, well, they were distant family friends, like relatives of relatives of relatives. So I am the very first person in my entire family from both sides that moved to the United States. No one before me has moved and no one after me has moved from my side of the family. Wow. Okay. No pressures on passing, passing down the culture. It's all you. <laughs> it's all me. We've got no one. And at some point I was a lost puppy. It was lonely. Number one, until, you know, of course I got married, married to my husband and we made our own little family here. And now it's the four of us in this country, but it gets lonely. I think a lot of immigrants will understand it gets lonely, especially during our holiday season and Christmas and yeah. the December holiday time. Everyone is with their family, Thanksgiving, and here right. you are by yourself. Right, right. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, we all get it. <laughs> and even now, we, we've just gotten used to it. It's not yeah. the same. It's not the same. The holidays that we celebrate really big. Uh, back home for me is from Nigeria. It's not the same that is celebrated here. And even when they celebrate the same holidays, it's, maybe there's a huge emphasis on shopping or sales and discounts. There's not yeah. as much cultural feel to some 100%. of those holidays. Yeah. yeah. And then, for example, October is a really big month for Indians in general who celebrate Diwali. October is one of the busiest times of the year for me at work. The busiest. I have so many work trips, offsite strategy meetings for the next year, planning meetings. And here I am trying to savor Diwali like someone would savor Christmas in December, but I'm working in the day like a lot. And so I'm not getting any days off. There's no shutdown right. during my holidays. And so right. sometimes you have to balance it out. And I have started becoming more vulnerable at work, bringing my authentic self at work and just sharing like, hey, guys, it's Diwali for me. I'll be taking a few days off. I really want to enjoy this festival with my family. And so mm. then I'm getting happy Diwali wishes for my colleagues, which is Aww. wonderful. Oh, I love uh, and, and your time. Your time is similar to mine, right? It's way off too. So even when you want to try and celebrate with people back home, they are way ahead of you, right? Yeah. <laughs> By the time your day ends, everybody is sleeping or, or something, or you're tired. It's tough. And especially, you know, with us being working women, us being moms, and then us taking care of like aging parents back home or even calling them to check in on them. The timing difference is so hard that if you don't prioritize that, then the day is going to go by. So then either they're sleeping or I'm off to sleep and I just don't get to speak to my parents and check in on them. So I now make it a priority that I need to check in on them every other day. And then weekends, we do lots of FaceTime, a long conversation, like just deep conversations. Otherwise, you just lose touch with your parents. You lose touch. Yeah, and yeah, absolutely. Siblings too, you know? Yeah. Well, thank you for making me feel homesick now. <laughs> no, it, it, you know, it is tough. But at some point, you have to um, accept that that's the journey we have chosen to take. And then how do you then make the most of your life in America? Because you've left so much behind. And when I speak to people at work, I tell them that. I said, you know, I come with resilience. I come with grit and perseverance and this can-do attitude because I've left so much behind to be in America and to be in corporate America. So I'm not here to like dilly dally and, you know, play around. I'm really here to do good work. I want to be successful. I want to work hard. So give me the opportunities so I can showcase my, you know, passion for marketing, marketing strategy and do good work because I've left so much behind to be here. Exactly. Exactly. So yeah, you kind of started talking about work already. So let's let's move there. So how was it like for you getting into corporate America and and well the legal aspect if you have any stories to share there. But I really mean the cultural aspect because I always say immigrants we have the culture of our country, we have the American culture, then we have the corporate culture. Right, because three different things, three different cultures, and depending on what part of the country you are located, 
for your work or what part of your country, the country your head office is, you have to figure that out. So how was that entry and, and all of that intersection for you when you got into the workplace? Um, it was challenging. It was difficult. And it was not a cakewalk. I chose to study marketing strategy. I chose to be this woman of color, this minority immigrant wanting to break into the marketing world, which is predominantly not a field immigrants pick, especially from India. A lot of my peers and friends are in tech. They do IT, they do engineering, they you know become doctors and lawyers. And that's something where there's an easy path, especially in Silicon Valley, right? It's a, this is a tech hub. You easily get into engineering. You easily get into an IT space because that's dominated by Southeast Asians in tech, which is great. However, for me, here I was trying to break into the marketing world, trying to get a work visa, and it was not easy. I've had lawyers or corporate companies tell me, you are a marketing person trying to get a work visa. And I said, yes, I, I really am good at what I do. And I do think my specialty and my skills are unique. And based on that interviewing, clearing these interviews and during the interview process requesting them that I would need a work visa was not the easiest thing but resilience hard work and never giving up has helped and there you are they have interviewed you know a lot of uh, different candidates and for some reason I was the right fit. They were willing to give me that opportunity. They were willing to put bet on me and give me that work visa to, to start working in corporate America. So I started with small companies. Um, there was a, a company in New York City where I started off with. And then after my MBA, it was my husband who said, Bhavna, if you want to grow your uh, marketing career, look at IT companies that do need marketing skill sets, get those skill sets, study and, you know, get yourself in that field. And so I started learning um, a lot of IT tech related terms. How does tech marketing work? What do SaaS companies need? How do the audience there think? And then that's how I maneuvered myself into corporate America from small businesses into corporate America. Um, I'm going to and- I'm going to go back and ask a little more context for the audience that is listening. I think you said something that we might know, but a lot of people might not get. This is a lot of immigrants, and I've had a guest that made a reference to this as well, who is also in the Bay Area and in tech. Is being easy for immigrants in tech fields when they come to the corporate world. Yes. You know, like like explain what that means, because people do know, you know, kind of understanding the student visa and all of the sponsorship that is required at work. If you have a tech degree as an immigrant, you have a better chance of getting sponsored by a corporation to come work. Right. That that is a whole topic on its own to talk about the legal requirement of um, H1B visa in, yes. in corporate. Right. And then you chose to study marketing and and what that means. You know, you want to talk about some of your challenges there a little more? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, And this goes back to what we were saying about how our parents inculcate so much in us. My parents told me when um, I was figuring out what I wanted to do in my career when I was 16 is actually when I knew I wanted to get into marketing. They said, Bhavna, you go do what you want to do, but then go be the best at it. You'd like to be a janitor, go be the best janitor there is. You'd like to be in marketing, go be the best marketeer there is. You want to be an engineer, go be the best engineer there is. Go follow your passion because when you follow your passion, you love what you do, success will follow, which is why I'm so thankful for them. They paid for my undergrad and for my grad school to come to the U.S. Even though they were earning in rupees, I was earning in the, and I was spending things in U.S. dollars. They paid for me to go into marketing, which is a field I chose. Less did I know that a field like this will only cause hurdles after hurdles after hurdles when it comes to requiring work visa sponsorship, also known as the H-1B for marketing. Um, The H-1B field is a specialized field for uh, folks like ourselves that are immigrants that would like to work in the U.S. and earn an income here. However, it's for specialized workers. So a lot of times um, 
the, the, the citizens, the U.S. citizens may not have the specialized knowledge for, you know, AI or ML or engineering or high tech jobs that require specialized um, education and experience. That's where they bring immigrant workers in. They sponsor a work visa. However, there are fields that are lesser known um, that folks feel that, you know, why can't a local person do that? Why can't a citizen do that? Which is why they have a good interview process to ensure that they get the right people. First, you know, the U.S. citizens. And if they cannot find U.S. citizens to fulfill these roles, that's when folks like ourselves that are immigrants get an opportunity through an H-1B mm-hmm. visa. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. And and part of it is also when it comes to the STEM field, there's a lot more jobs, especially in the part of the country where you are right now with all of the biotech, tech companies, um, science companies. So there's more, there's more slots for sponsorship for STEM. And and so being in marketing, you are even limiting yourself to a smaller po- uh, puddle, a smaller pool of, 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 of opportunities. But you did it, you got in, and I mean, that's amazing. You know, this is part of why the community that we're building with Immigrants Incorporate is also includes groups and conversations on how those that are trying to do the same thing, right? To make a choice on their career you are very fortunate that your parents supported that uh, because a lot of times people make decisions on their career based on the market yeah that's true i to you know to your point i'm very very fortunate and i had to make sure that i'm successful so i can sort of like you know prove to myself and also sort of tell my parents you know you put your trust in me and i did not disappoint and so there's always that when they send you over here there's always that also desire within us immigrants to be successful. I've also not let the H-1B visa transfer process get in the way of career progression. I have uh, moved jobs and roles if they've come my way. So if I was, you know, a few years ago at um, a certain uh, huge SaaS company, I got an opportunity through LinkedIn to move to another company. And I said, yes, I say yes to life. I say yes to opportunities as an immigrant. I do not say no, because if we don't say yes and we don't put ourselves out there, we're just basically staying we are where we are and not growing. So um, I took that interview and during the interview, I told the recruiter, I'm an H-1B candidate. I will require sponsorship if this is something your company can do at this point. I want to honor your time and respect your time and not proceed. And even with my most recent move, that's something I made very clear from the very beginning. So I would highly recommend and advise those that are interviewing to be very transparent about this ask and and bring it up in the very beginning for your time and even Mm -hmm. for the company's time. Yeah, yeah. And and that's a good point. Uh, I I love the way you put it at the interview. Um, because my experience, what I've always tried to tell people is people self-eliminate. They don't oh, even yeah. apply for the jobs at all. They just stay put where they are, even when they have, you know, miserable, toxic work conditions. Um, they don't say yes to an opportunity because they're like, it doesn't fit in with my visa category. Or I don't think they sponsor, right? Don't self-eliminate. Apply. Let give give them an opportunity to get to know you and your skills. Um, but early on, before they make the final decision, you know, sh- ask them um, about the sponsorship. So that, that's a really good point. I like it. A hundred percent. And, you know, people like to work with those they like. We're human beings at the end of the day. And nobody from a piece of paper or a resume can tell, you know, your attitude towards life. So to your point, 100%, please apply. Please have that call with a recruiter. Please reach out. You know, take those interviews. Don't self-eliminate yourself. Yeah. Right. Right. So um, what, what do you currently do? And when you think about your work condition and all of these intersections, right, your program and just um, the competition in, in your field, you've moved around quite a bit. When you think yeah. about things yeah. like, you know, the way you lead, the way you show up and do your work. Yeah. What are some of the ways that you think being an immigrant has uh, shown up for you? You know, I know, of course, there are barriers. You can talk about some of the barriers, but I also, you know, want to hear the other side of it. How has your experiences, your background 
being able to be used as an advantage at the workplace? Great question. Um, I'll start off by saying that the first sale you make to yourself is to yourself. So believe in yourself when you're going into the workplace. Believe in your um, sort of strengths, like hone in your strengths is what I try to say. The first thing I do is, you know, I've sort of written down behind my laptop what I stand for. And so personally, I know that I'm I'm fearless, I'm determined, I'm tough, I'm ambitious, I have grit and perseverance. That's just who I am. And I bring that into the workplace. I bring Bhavna to the workplace, irrespective of the country or the you know part of the world I'm in. So be your authentic self is the first thing. And the second thing that I recently started doing, Lola, that has been working out well for me is uh, speaking about the fact that I am unique. I am different from everyone else around me, right? Whether it's my accent or my cultural background or, you know, my, that fact that I'm a woman, I'm a woman of color, I'm an immigrant, all those things. I now wear it proudly like a badge of honor when I walk in. There was a time in early on in my career when I would try to like blend in too much or assimilate too much and try to laugh at a joke I didn't understand or a sports analogy like a baseball or, you know, something that I didn't understand. That's a very like an American thing to do. And now I assimilate, but I also stand out and I'm not afraid to stand up and say, that, that's very interesting. I'd love to learn more because I don't understand that sports analogy or I don't understand that joke about that team versus that team or a very American uh, you know, term that they use. And right. the minute I started doing that, I showed up as my authentic self and people realized that uh, you know, she's leaning in, she's being, being vulnerable, but she's, t- she's trying her best to assimilate. And I think right. that has beautifully for me because I no longer wear a mask trying to be uh, from here and trying to be like you know basically somebody who was born here or went to high school here or elementary or middle school because I did not and so it's very important that when I'm in awe of something for example as we were talking in California there was a heat wave so they had these buses that were picking up people from the streets taking them to cooling centers and I was like, what? That's amazing. Like that never happened in India. And so I was in a meeting at work this week and I'm like, guys, this is really cool. You don't understand how cool this is. And they're like, Bhavna, this is normal. I'm like, for you, yes. But I think this is so cool that you're doing this here. And then there are some things that remind me of the food in India. And I'll share it with my team. You know, like in India, there's this bread we make. This is how we make it. Um, and if I don't understand something, I'm like, I, I'm not, I don't get it. And I'll say it. Right. So I'm not going to be fake and laugh at a joke I don't understand anymore. Yeah, I can definitely relate with that one. Uh, and I think people don't know how how hard that is for an immigrant, especially in the workplace. Um, so sometimes we also miss the opportunity to educate people, right? Because, again, it could go both ways. What's the worst that could happen is people would think you're weird and they won't talk to you or they would exclude you. But then that says a lot about that workplace. That says a lot about that team, not about you as an immigrant. Um, Because being able to, if you speak up and ask questions in a workplace environment where you don't understand something and the workplace embraces inclusion, somebody would take the time to um, bring you into the conversation somebody would make note of the fact that we were being exclusive and uh, there's an opportunity to learn here and make a change. A hundred percent. And the other thing is that's why the role of like DEI experts like yourself is so important in corporate America. And I encourage folks that are starting to, you know, uh, review companies they want to work for or have a wish list or start interviewing and applying to look at the DEI page to see if this company is inclusive or not. I have been super fortunate to work for companies that are super inclusive. Um, they want to learn about this different culture. And then these companies have um, cultural clubs, you know, different clubs you can be part of that you can then raise awareness. Um, so there's that. There's also this uh, whole initiative that we're starting where, you know, we talk about 
women immigrants or women of color and how we were raised, you know, we were raised to say that talking about your accomplishments, talking about the fact that you are super accomplished is considered taboo in some of our cultures. Like women don't, don't toot your own horn. Don't talk about yourself and sing your praises. That's very like being full of yourself. That doesn't work in corporate America. You want a promotion. You want to grow. It's the opposite. You have to share your accomplishments. You have to talk about the impact you've had to business. So unlearning that cultural barrier and overcoming that was also, I would say, a key to my success. It was right. hard. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I'll, I'll say that's a big one. That's, um, that's definitely a good example to bring into this conversation uh, because we're not just talking about being an immigrant. We're talking about being an immigrant in the corporate world. What are some of the key areas that you have to learn to unlearn <laughs> some things from your background? That's, that's learning to, that's sharing, talking about your accomplishment, talking about your ambitions so that people know what you are looking for. It's a key part of advancing and thriving in corporate world. Um, so, Also observing and sort of observing and learning how um, other folk, folks are... Um, what they're doing, how they're behaving at work. For example, there is this Indian cultural habit where we Indians, uh, when we're agreeing with somebody, you, you know, we'd interrupt and say, oh, yes, 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 I agree. But in America, in corporate America, it's considered super rude if you are interrupting when someone is speaking. And that is something I had to learn to say, you know, even if I'm agreeing with you, I should let you finish your sentence and finish your thought and then chime in. So there's these small things that can be needle movers and that can really make an impact in how you show up in corporate America. There's so much to learn from our our, our uh, peers who were born here. And I observe, I observe a lot. I learn a lot. The mannerisms, how they conduct themselves in a meeting room, how they speak, or, you know, and I try to invite that. So yes, it's about assimilating and learning, but it's also about staying your unique self and staying rooted to your culture. Right, right. And, and that balance, that balance is why it's important to find a community of other immigrant professionals who can support you because there is a very fine line between learning what's been done, understanding what you need to pick to do your job, but losing yourself completely and becoming something you are not can happen if you don't pay attention, you know, to, to that, that fine line. Oh, yes. It's such a fine balance. And to your point, like it's assimilation, but it's not forgetting our roots because we cannot lose who we are or, you know, or stay who we were. I think it's it's a very fine balance, but a very conscious one, like a conscious one. Um, and, and is you know, I, I think this is a very important topic. I think this is important conversation to have because this is a combination of two different things that could be very harmful, right? You have immigrants and professionals who are hardworking, who are ready to give it their best and just do a great job. But if you don't know the nuances, if you don't understand what's happening, this is where mental health, things like mental health can even become an issue, right? Uh, because you're working hard. You feel like you're doing everything you should do and you don't have a life outside of work and but you're just not happy and you're not fulfilled and you're not advancing right? Working hard is not the same thing as working smart um, in, in the corporate world. Yeah. And a big, big piece for us immigrants and working smart is what I just mentioned is, you know, observing uh, the cultural differences, assimilating, but also making this a two-way street where not only are we assimilating, but we're also sharing back something about our uniqueness, right? We are unique. We, we can blend in. We, we are unique. We should proudly, like a badge of honor, stand out while still assimilating as we can. Uh, also, one thing that keeps coming up for me that I struggle with for many years that now I've overcome is it starts with me and it ends with me. I've got no like fall back as you know my colleagues say oh my aunt is picking up my mom will drop off the kids are there this weekend I me and my husband get me time 
in India, I had the support system. I had a tribe here. The buck stops here. It's me. If I don't get up and get them ready or my husband doesn't do it, no one else will. And that takes a lot of physical, emotional, mental cycles to manage it all. If you want to have a career, you want to have a family, you want to have some social life, you want to give back to the community a lot. And there's just, you know, two hands to do it all. Right, right. And and you talk about if you want a career, a lot of immigrants, um, couples, families, young couples, uh, both working parents is, is usually even if you have a spouse, it's not like back home where you have a community and you can easily take a step back from your career and say, you know, I just want to stay home for nah, you got to pay the bills. <laughs> you have to raise the kids. So if kids are involved, it's a different kind of pressure. Yeah. And when you're in a visa, you can't take time off. You can't take a sabbatical because you're too stressed. You can't say I'm pregnant. So I'm going to take nine months off. No, I worked till the ninth month go running in the office bathroom to throw up and then driving an hour each way and pulling on the highway to throw up again. Like I didn't take no time off. I worked the entire nine months, both my children, because I was in a work visa and I couldn't take time off. Legally, I couldn't take time off until I went on maternity leave. Right. So different different, different rules here when you're an immigrant, when they're, they're, there's legal barriers that we don't have a control over. Um, and then you go in the workplace and there's, there's other aspects. So if you could talk to somebody who, were, who was in the same place where you were um, when you came, right? Uh, somebody coming from India, a student who is coming into college, or an immigrant who just graduated from college and is getting their first job. What would be the advice you would give them? What kind of things, what helped you? What tools can you share um, that they can leverage? That's a wonderful question. The The first thing I would say is uh, know your why, W-H-Y, know your why, know why you're here, know why you want to succeed, know why you want to do that. And that why is going to help you through your tough days. Um, so when you fall down, it's been a long day and you're like, oh, I miss home. This is too hard. That why will, will bring you up again for the next day. That's That was important to me. Number two, have... Um, grit and perseverance to keep going you know perseverance will take you a long way you've got 10 rejections for an interview take that 11th one you know you might the 11th one might be it at work you've just started grit perseverance and showing up every day makes the difference that's number two and number three don't be afraid to get out there and meet people and get to know different people within the company people like people who are still human beings at the end of the day so put yourself out there, get to know folks just outside of work, you know, so not a formal work meeting or a work offsite, but a coffee. And these days we are virtual. So grab a Zoom coffee or just talk to them about things you can relate to, whether it's like parent to a parent or from, you know, if you're single, talk about your life being single. Just try to find commonalities so you can build um, a good working relationship with, with several key team members. Right. You can build and that community. Community is is key. 100%. And, and even as immigrants, we, we need it. We can find it in the workplace and outside of it. Yeah. We need our tribe, to your point, 100%. You know, we need our village. We need, we need our tribe. That doesn't mean that everyone in your tribe and community um, has, you know, looks like you or, or is from the same uh, background. A tribe could be anywhere you feel at home and you feel safe where you can talk and relate to them. I've got tribes. I've got a mommy group. Um, and I also lead a blog called Love, Pray, Love, Slate. That is for moms to motivate moms and especially first generation immigrant mothers. So I've got that mom tribe. I've got um, other um uh, folks that I talk just marketing with, you know, they, these are women in Silicon Valley who have done exceptionally well in, in marketing and we exchange ideas about business. Then I've got my tribe of Indian first generation immigrant friends. And then I have a tribe of uh, friends that were born here. Their parents are immigrants and they tell me things that their parents did and did not do and how they felt. And that'll help raise Ariana and Viraj because I'm sure my kids are going through some things where they question why their mom and dad do certain things. 
And so <laughs> I think it would be a drive. I say so. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Like I have friends that tell me, you know, our parents didn't put us in any activity when they came back in the 70s. So now we want to put our kids in every single activity out there. Or, you know, I wish our parents taught us the language or, you know, things like that. And th those are things that I take as a learning lesson from their parents' experience that I want to give to my children. That's important. What you also said about communities, different communities, because um, I was recently talking to a friend who is also an immigrant and I'm just discovering where they work. And a lot of these friends, because when we got together 12 years ago, when I just got married, we were all young couples without kids. And so we were a community for ourselves. But as the years roll by now and, you know, the kids are growing and we're all discovering each other in a different way, right? Oh, this person can actually be a career support for me, right? But identify what areas you need support and find that tribe. It doesn't have to be just look for immigrants. It's look for a tribe in the areas where you want to develop or you need support. 100%. And at some point, because we've been uprooted from our countries and cultures, we've got to sort of put our roots down here. And the tribe helps you feel rooted. The tribe helps you feel like a sense of belonging. And they sort of create this home away from home for you, right? Because otherwise, you would just feel like a lost puppy. So you've got to reroute yourself as an immigrant somewhere. Right, right. Immigrants in Corporate Inc., that's the kind of community we are trying to be, is other immigrants professionals. If you are working in the corporate workplace, it doesn't have to be corporate America. If you are in the corporate world, you want to learn to speak the corporate language where you are, in your industry, in the country you are, but you are from somewhere else. So some of the things that we want to focus on is helping to recognize where those lines are and, and what you can do to, uh, to thrive at work. So thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, any final thoughts, anything else you want to share before we go to the final question? No, this has been fantastic. Let's do our final question. Thank you. Thank you for being here. All right. So let's talk food because I always like mm. to leave these questions hungry. <laughs> I usually like to end with a final question. If you could share a dish, maybe a snack or a fruit with your coworkers, that is from your own country, what would that dish be and why? Oh, that's such a great question. I love food as well. Um, and I have to tell you, in my work meetings, we do these icebreakers every week and we ask questions. And, you know, one of the questions someone recently asked is if you could eat a last meal, like what would that last meal be? And this reminds me of that question. So I would say it has to be um, my mom's, Baratas, which is like an Indian bread. It could be stuffed with like cottage cheese or potatoes or what have you, but it's just made with so much love. You dough, you made the dough right there and then you, you know, cook it with butter. And then I would have that with Indian masala tea and, um, you know, homemade uh, mango pickle. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I know those names because I love Indian food, but I can bet what I'm eating in America is not even the same as the real thing. <laughs> oh my God. If you ever meet in person or you come by or I come there, I'm going to make it for you. Cause now I have nailed it down. My kids love it. And it is soul food. It is. You know, we have it on record, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> thank you so much, Bhavna. It was, it was nice chatting with you and thank you for what you are doing. Um, we're going to share your socials and your work as well, because I think apart from having a thriving career in the corporate world, in corporate America, you are also giving back in a lot of ways uh, to other professionals. So um, I, I applaud you for your success and, and hope to continue to stay in touch. So are you. So I love are you. I love the I platform. absolutely love, I what, absolutely you're love what you're uh, doing. Thank you for uh, having thank me. Thank you for it's having me. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for joining me, Lola Adeyemo, as always, for these important conversations on the corporate world of work from the immigrant perspective. 
For more resources and upcoming events, please visit our website www.immigrantsincorporate.org. You can also follow us on Instagram at Immigrants Incorporate. If you are on LinkedIn, please join the group Thriving in Intersectionality Immigrants Incorporate America. There will be a new episode every week, so make sure you are subscribed to get notified. Please leave us a rating, leave a review, and I hope to see you next time. Thank you.